Okay. We're going to go ahead and get started as people are trickling in here. So, um, Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Elizabeth McCarowitz and I work uh, in membership at the Land Stewardship Project here based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, I'm really excited this evening to have lots of folks who have perhaps not interacted with LSP before. Um, here's a map of where y'all are coming from. Um, but I also wanna invite you to go ahead and share in the chat um, your name, uh, your pronouns, if you like, and also where you're coming from um, and, and maybe how you interact with the food system. So are you a farmer, a consumer, nonprofit employee? Um, just go ahead and share that information in the chat. Uh, this is the game plan for the tonight. Um, for the, about the first 10 minutes, we're gonna go over some housekeeping stuff and I'll introduce you to LSP for those of you who are new and also our racial justice work. Um, we're gonna go over some shared agreements um, and then ground and um, a land acknowledgement. Uh, then we'll get to hear from John, of course, and followed by about 45 minutes of presentation, we'll have half an hour for questions and answers. So I know we've all been on Zoom um, for a little while now, um, at least many of you probably have, but just a couple of reminders. For our time tonight, please um, stay muted throughout the call. I also ask that um, you can rename yourself by clicking the, um, just find your name on the screen and click the three little dots and um, you can rename yourself with pronouns and location. Um, I also recommend that you use speaker mode um, this evening. That'll probably work best for the presentation. Um, and then please hold your questions in the chat until the Q&A session. Um, that'll make it just a little bit easier for us to track what's going on. I don't want your questions to get buried in the chat. Um, apologies, I'm gonna be reading a little bit of text um, off the screen. Uh, I just wanna make sure that if there's anyone calling in to the Zoom call this evening that they can fully um, participate. Um, so for those of you who are new to Land Stewardship Project, um, we're a member-based organization um, founded in 1982 to foster an ethic of stewardship of farmland to promote sustainable agriculture and to develop healthy communi communities. Uh, we're dedicated to creating transformational change in our food and farming system our work has a broad and deep impact from new farmer training and local organizing to federal policy and community-based food systems development. At the core of our work are the values of stewardship, justice, and democracy. So related to our mission, we believe that we can't have a healthy food and farming system in this nation without creating opportunities for all. Um, about 10 years ago when LSP started, um, delving into racial justice organizing um, and activism, we met with some allies of color and overwhelmingly the number one thing we heard from them was that we needed to organize our people. Um, and as a white, a mostly white organization, that means that we need to organize other white people to be anti-racist. So in that spirit, um, a group of around 30 of us have gathered this past month to study and talk about whiteness, how to locate it in our lives, um, especially as it pertains to food systems issues. John's work, of course, has been central to that study group. So this is a bit of a capstone for our study group that is open to people beyond. <laughs> um, I also, um, want to invite y'all if you're if these topics really resonate with you, you can become a member of LSP by heading to our website. Um, and that's just a, a, a great way for you to stay engaged in this work and um, moving forward. I also want to lift up um, this evening the Midwest Farmers of Color Collective with whom we are sharing proceeds from this event. Um, the MFCC is a collective of farmers of color working for racial justice and the development of food and farming systems that honor our communities. 
in a region where the majority of land and agricultural resources are controlled by white farmers and policymakers, it is critical for us to have spaces to build social connections with each other and to organize for economic and political power. I invite you all to support MFCC and their ongoing work um, by heading to uh, the website below and you can become a pledging member of MFCC or make a one-time donation. Uh, I also, before we get too deep into things here, I wanna go over some shared agreements. Um, these are shared agreements we use for any kind of racial justice organizing we do here at LSP. So we want to recognize that we do not have all the people in the room or in this case, the virtual space to address all forms of oppression in our communities. Recognize that this is a predominantly white space. Um, we recognize that we're not going to solve social injustice and structural oppression in an hour and a half, which is all we have today. Um, social justice work is hard and ongoing. We are here to learn and grow, not to feel guilty or sorry for ourselves. And lastly, liberation is possible. If you can get on board with these shared agreements, go ahead and flash a thumbs up on your screen or using the reaction function. I also, before I pass it on to Lisa, I wanna ground in a couple of images um, to share with you this evening. The first of these images is a picture of um, the Bedote, uh, which is the spot uh, where the Minnesota and Mississippi rivers converge considered by many Dakota to be the center of the universe. If you look closely, you'll see that the water to the right of this picture is pretty brown. That's topsoil that you see that's causing that. I'm sharing this photo with you this evening because I think it's a really great visual representation of what whiteness looks like in indigenous sacred spaces. In this case, it looks like soil erosion. And also we know a giant dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. As an agricultural organization, we cannot talk about, we can't not talk about land, how we treat it, how we occupy it, who has access to it. I invite you all here today, not just to know the names of the indigenous people from, who come from where you live, but also to do what you can to support their efforts for liberation. In most cases, this means donating money to organizations that are led by Black, Indigenous, people of color. The other thing on my mind today is George Floyd. Our Minneapolis office is just three blocks north of where George Floyd was killed. Many LSP staff and members live in this neighborhood and participated in the uprising that followed his death. Floyd's killer is on trial this week and many of us are anxiously awaiting the outcome. This is probably not news to a bunch of people who showed up for a talk on whiteness, but I just wanna remind you all that until George Floyd and people like him are free, none of us are. Let's just take a few moments to breathe. And now I'm going to pass it on to Lisa Heldke, who is an LSP member, uh, professor of philosophy at Gustavus Adolphus, and also a longtime friend of John Ewan. Thanks very much, Elizabeth, and welcome to all of you. I'm happy to be here tonight with you and um, wish that I could have been a part of your uh, long discussion group, which sounds just terrific. John Bewin is a podcaster. Well, that's one of the things that he is. He's the creator of Seen on Radio. Seeing White, the series that brings you all here tonight, represents that podcast's third season. An article about Bewin in the prestigious Columbia Journalism Review entitled The Man Who Saw Himself offers some insightful glimpses into the evolution of John's work on race and racism. For instance, there's a piece that he did for Minnesota Public Radio 30 years after 1964's summer, uh, Freedom Summer, which was obviously 1994. That piece called Oh Freedom Over Me 
documented the work of young volunteers registering voters in the South. The article points out that the piece is, as it says, traditional in its approach. If not quite dispassionate, it nevertheless maintains something of an editorial distance. That distance in John's work narrowed, I think, in Little War on the Prairie, a, a piece that probably many of you are familiar with, an hour-long work that explores the way that the U.S.-Dakota War is understood by present residents of southern Minnesota. John, who's from Mankato, places himself squarely in that story, narrating the places of his childhood, places he wandered with no idea that they were sites at which the Dakota people were swindled out of their land and ultimately forced out of the newly found state of Minnesota. But it's with seeing white that B. Wynn's approach closes that editorial distance still further by unfolding an account of whiteness and white privilege in America that makes it clear that John understands that, well, that he's white. That is, he is a beneficiary, beneficiary of and participant in those systems of privilege. The article describes seeing white as what they say is a process, a journey that, quote, addresses the gamut of institutionalized racism in the United States. A journey embarked on by a guy who says, I liked to think of myself as a person who had always been sympathetic to the cause of people of color. But there was also a sense in which that was their cause. And I was over here cheering, rooting them on. And that's crazy when you think about it. You have to personally deal with the extent you've benefited from it. You can't just sit back and observe. And that, among other things, is what Seeing White does. John creates this podcast as the audio program director at the Center for Documentary Studies, a role in which he also teaches. Before joining CDS, he reported for American Radio Works, NPR News, and Minnesota Public Radio. You may have heard him on All Things Considered, on This American Life, on the BBC World Service. He's also co-editor of a book called Reality Radio, Telling True Stories in Sound. And as Elizabeth mentioned, she invited me to introduce John tonight because we've known each other since the time before John even knew what public radio was when we were philosophy majors together at Gustavus Adolphus College. And I wanna report that I still remember the name of one of his papers, um, which was, A Man's Gotta Do What A Man's Gotta Do, which was a paper about predeterminism, I think. John credits one of our old teachers with being the guy who suggested he consider getting a job in public radio after college. And as long as we're handing out credit to people, I think I have to say that it was John who introduced me, a feminist philosopher, to feminist philosophy. He was taking a class in the subject before I knew it was a subject. Um, he was taking it while he was working as a public radio reporter in Moorhead, Minnesota, I think. I will totally confess that I may have been one of the people who lobbied him hard to go to graduate school in philosophy, something he did for a nanosecond before realizing what a terrible idea it was. But while life in academic philosophy was not the path for him, John is nevertheless a philosopher. And I have him on videotape saying so. In an event that he did for our department some years ago, he described himself as doing philosophy for people with a short attention span or people who are something of a ham, he said. But he went on to say in all seriousness that his work is devoted to questions that are at the heart of philosophy. Uh, questions like, what matters here? How should we live? How should we live together? And even more broadly, how do we pay attention? He's with us tonight to pay attention with us by seeing whiteness in the food system. So it's a pleasure to welcome my old friend and colleague and classmate, John Bewin. Thanks for being here, John. Oh, Lisa, thank you so much for that thoughtful and gracious <laughs> introduction. It's really great to be here with you personally, I gotta say. Um, and to and with all of you, thanks thanks for coming. I'm just uh, touched um, and honored by the turnout and by the invitation. Um, and this is in uh, in in it's in several levels, kind of a you know maybe you can go home again kind of moment for me. Um, you know, reconnecting with Lisa and with Minnesota. Um, I have where I have not lived for. It's literally 20 years this year that I moved from Minnesota to North Carolina. Uh, greetings from Durham all. Um, but also with the Land Stewardship Project, which um, when Elizabeth reached out to me, I, I just, I had to say um, <clears throat> the very earliest, relatively early days of my 
life as a cub reporter for Minnesota Public Radio, one of the first kind of substantial special projects I did was this, and I believe it was 1988 if I had to, and I don't even have, you know, somewhere in a closet somewhere, I might have a file that has those scripts in it, but I, it would, I don't know where I would look actually. Maybe in my office, which I haven't been to for a year, <clears throat> but um, a three-part series on the sustainable agriculture movement which at that time, at least to me, was a novel idea. Um, and it was something that was kind of new in the world, at least I think in the mainstream. And um, anyway, and the Land Stewardship Project was, was the primary kind of source and touchstone for that, for that series in, in looking at it, uh, at the movement, if you like, in, in Minnesota. Um, so actually, yeah, this is, I was really tickled um, to get this invitation and to hear that you all are um, working on being an anti-racist organization and talking about whiteness. Um, couldn't be more delighted to be, to be part of this. Um, so I'm gonna do this thing, you know, I'm gonna talk for 40 minutes or so and play some clips. And, and, and for, for those of you who have listened to the Seeing White series, this, some of this, most of this will be um, familiar and redundant and forgive me for that. Uh, for some of you, it won't be. And maybe even those, for some of you who've heard it, it, some of this stuff, I think it's so counter to our um, mainstream training as white Americans, some of these ideas that it doesn't hurt to hear them more than once. Um, and then I would love to hear your, your questions after that. I'm gonna share my screen in a minute um, once we get going. But you know, also I wanna, I appreciate the, uh, the land acknowledgement and the acknowledgement of the trial that's taking place in Minneapolis, many, many eyes on Minneapolis, of course, right now, uh, including mine, I'm following that. Um, I haven't been watching the trial yet. Um, trying to get some work done, but I have certainly been paying attention and looking at the highlights of it. And, um, uh, I, and it was quite a, quite a moment for all of us, I think, and looking to see if maybe some justice can be done for a change. Um, we are in an extraordinary, I think, fraught period in the history of this country. Um, there's a moment of pain and alarm and maybe also of some hope if you recognize that in US history and world history for that matter, very often the deepest crises, um, things like the Civil War, the Great Depression have often been moments that have unleashed some of the most profound change in the direction of justice and equality and democracy. Um, you know, and right now as, as you've all heard and noticed, <laughs> we have multiple crises layered on top of one another. Um, a once in a century pandemic, profound threats to our democracy from within, which did not end on Inauguration Day. Um, and in response to a crisis of police violence and systemic racism, we saw uh, the Black Lives Matter uprising last year um, by many measures, the, large, the biggest protest movement in US history. There's been a lot of talk about a reckoning. Um, and I smile a little bit, but I don't mean, I don't mean to smirk at that term. It's, it's, you know, but I think it's, it's another reckoning in a long series of them around white supremacy in the US. Um, after George Floyd's murder, we had a moment in which it really seemed that more white Americans than ever were displaying a willingness to confront the reality of this country and of its history, including what it means to be white or to be one of the people that this society calls white. Um, you know, has that energy and urgency completely dissipated? Personally, I'm not ready to say that, um, that, oh, that's over, everybody's gone back to sleep and back to brunch. And in fact, maybe the fact that we're here this evening is one um, data point on the side of the argument that you know more quietly the conversations and the learning and the reckoning continue. And I believe that's the case at least for many people. Sure, some people were happy to kind of see the sugar high 
fade away and go back to um, brunch. But I have some hope that, that the reckoning continues for many people. The question is, will enough of us, including enough white people, stay awake and stay active to the point where we'll make real and lasting change? In that spirit, um, I'm here to talk to you, I guess, about some work that I've done primarily in the form of this podcast series, exploring the meaning and the many uses of whiteness in American life. Uh, and based on my own experience and the experience of so many of our listeners that I've heard from, I'm gonna claim that this, there's a shift in perspective that, that can be powerful and, um, for any, anyone trying to understand how racism works, but especially for those of us deemed white, turning the lens and looking at race through the construction of whiteness can take us to a new kind of understanding of white supremacy and how it works and really what it is, um, <clears throat> an understanding that tends to elude us as white people. And I believe it eludes us by design. The fact is race is a story that we tell. Some people decided to tell that story at some point and we inherited it. Our challenge is to unlearn it and then to fight against the perpetuation of that story and, the, and its, its costs and its violence. So I'm gonna share my screen. How's that? Okay, seeing the thumbs up. So, and I'm gonna start by talking about the origins of the Seeing White project. <clears throat> and I'm gonna reach way back, especially most of you all are in Minnesota. This is a Minnesota organization. Um, and I'm just gonna spend a few minutes connecting all this to my earlier life as a white dude from Minnesota. How did I come to be a white guy in later middle age with white hair doing a project like Seeing White. So as Lisa mentioned, uh, I grew up in Mankato in a rather large family that you may have picked me out. Um, and uh, my parents were what you might call good Minnesota liberals. They worked on the McGovern campaign. Um, <clears throat> It was a heartbreaker. <laughs> I remember my mom crying when he got absolutely crushed. Um, and my dad in particular, he was a high school English teacher and basketball coach. And he really pretty overtly tried to raise us with a concern for social justice that, that he got from the nuns who educated him in Catholic schools. I think he did not get it from his parents in Austin, Minnesota, but he got it from the nuns. And, and I grew up in a family where race, racism got talked about. And I'm gonna really uh, date myself here by saying that, you know, my parents would sit us down in front of the TV when the Sidney Poitier movies came on, you know, or To Kill a Mockingbird, which was on TV about once a year, it seems in those days. Roots, of course, in the 70s. Uh, they made sure we got the point and I did. Racism is wrong. Racists are bad people. This, this did not seem like a tough one morally. But looking back, um, it was all pretty abstract given the overwhelming whiteness of Southern Minnesota at that time. The images on the TV seemed to be, um, it's like they were being beamed in from some other place and often from some other time. I didn't feel personally implicated, I would say. I feel like I'm still kind of trying to get over that <laughs> impression. Went to Gus Davis, got that degree in philosophy, then stumbled into a job with Minnesota Public Radio. Yes, at the suggestion of my, a dear professor that uh, Lisa and I had in, in common. As a young reporter, I made documentaries about migrant work, migrant farm workers and their experiences both in Texas and Minnesota on the history of anti-Semitism in Minneapolis. I did lots of reporting about poverty in America, which isn't always about racism per se, but of course is often intertwined with it. 
Lisa mentioned this project in 1994. I was asked to produce a one hour documentary about Freedom Summer, the deadly civil rights campaign in Mississippi in 1964. I had the privilege of interviewing a couple dozen veterans of that movement, people like John Lewis, Bob Moses, Anita Blackwell. <clears throat> I learned about Fannie Lou Hamer and also those white Northerners who volunteered, put themselves on the line to register black voters in the Jim Crow South and black Mississippians like this couple in the Delta, the Reverend JJ and Irma Russell, who had risked everything to register as voters. <clears throat> That experience was consuming and it shook me. And, and some things began to sink in in a new way, that this was all, how, how, how truly deep and pervasive white supremacy is in America and how, how recent this kind of racism was that much of the United States had effectively been an apartheid society <clears throat> excuse me, with white supremacist one party rule in my lifetime. It was all, <clears throat> it was getting somewhat less abstract. Through 30 years as a public radio reporter, I remained fascinated and preoccupied with these divisions and deep inequalities. What is the experience of a single black mom raising kids on the minimum wage on Chicago's west side? or a family on the Red Lake Reservation, or a farmer uh, on the Hopi Nation in Arizona. What's it like for these folks, given you know, trying to make it in this world, this society, given everything, <laughs> but given what exactly, right? Looming, uh, you know, looking back on it now, all this reporting, I think presupposed an elephant in the room, but rarely named it and never really interrogated it directly. I mean, these were, this is reporting that acknowledged discrimination very often, but there was always the implication that if someone was discriminating, it was kind of a small subset of the bad people. The elephant in the room was, was as I said, not acknowledged. Fast forward a lot, uh, it's the 20 teens on this middle-aged guy living and working uh, at Duke in North Carolina. I'm now producing this podcast, which means I can pretty much take on any topic I want, give it the time and attention I wanna give it. And going back about a half dozen years now, 2014, 15 into 16, I found myself with this question growing in my mind and it kept getting more and more urgent. And it was about that elephant in the room, really just what is up with us white people <laughs> at long last, not the bad apples and not even the people with swastikas, hoods and Confederate battle flags. They are a real threat. They commit most of the domestic terrorism in our country. But I was feeling this deep unease about all of us white people writ large. What drove this question? I probably don't need to tick off the things, you all were there too, but, but I will quickly. Probably for me really started with the death of Trayvon Martin, and Michael Brown, Eric Garner, Sandra Bland, Freddie Gray, Jonathan Farrell, Sam DuBose, Walter Scott, Tamir Rice, Terrence Crutcher, Laquan McDonald, and so on and so on, right? Through Alton Sterling, Stefan Clark, Philando Castile. And I could go on. All unarmed black people killed by police or a neighborhood watch guy in the case of George Zimmerman, <clears throat> Trayvon Martin's killer. And say what you like about each of these cases, <clears throat> excuse me, the story was always that the officer feared for his or her life. I believe, and I think I know that in most and probably all of these cases, if it's me or my young adult son or daughter encountering that cop, we come out alive. What else in that period? Dylan Roof, white supremacist terrorist and the Charleston massacre, 
affirmative action for white people in the culture. Oscar's so white and so on. And beneath these visible anecdotal events, just the overwhelming data, study after study proving systemic racism in every institution we have, housing segregation, job discrimination, the deeply racialized inequities in our schools and our criminal legal system, a legacy of unequal opportunity, to put it politely, such that for every dollar the average white household owns today in assets, the average black family has about a dime. And on top of all that, thanks to our new world of ever-present smartphones with video cameras, now we had the drip drip of racist moments from the everyday of American life, incidents we would not have seen in before the smartphone, but were now captured and sent across the internet. White cops and school cops manhandling black teenage girls, white folks calling the police on black people for waiting in a coffee shop, having a barbecue in a park, trying to go home to their own apartment building. And uh, this one, remember those kids in Oklahoma? I think this was about 2015. Uh, and a content warning, this short video includes a familiar racial epithet. Fraternity brothers seen on video engaging in a racist chant. And tonight they're hey, man, Finally, uh, the last straw for me was the rise of <clears throat> Donald J. Trump and the embrace or at least the acceptance of his, and this is where, you know what, I, 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 I as much reporting as I'd done on race and thinking and reading about race, I thought I was a pretty hard-nosed realist about racism in America, that I was not terribly naive. But I, this is where I gotta say, I thought there can never be more than about 10 or 15% of Americans voting for this guy for president. Could, could they, could we, could we? So the embrace or at least the acceptance of this strikingly raw brand of white identity politics, ultimately by a majority of white Americans in two elections as it would turn out. So, Fraternity. Sorry. All this led to seeing white. <laughs> I started working on it in the middle of 2016 and it launched uh, a few weeks after Trump's inauguration in February, 2017. Here's a two and a half minute clip to get us going. This is the opening of the second episode in the series. And maybe, you know, of course your book starts thousands of years ago, yeah. but Here's a thought I had about the starting point, mm -hmm. which is um, when I was in high school in Minnesota in the late 1970s, mm -hmm. I, re I can still remember very vividly in my social studies textbook, the three races oh, of yeah. man. Yeah, yeah. And I can see the images yeah. of the mongoloid, the caucasoid, and the negroid. Uh -huh. um, it was presented as a scientific biological That's right. fact. That's right. That's right. Sort of like, the, you know, yeah. there's certain kinds yeah. of rocks and yeah. here's the map yeah. of the world yeah. and then these yeah. are the three races. Yeah. So um, is it a scientific biological fact? <laughs> the three races um, in the order usually presented, Caucasoid, Mongoloid, and Negroid, Caucasoid at the top, uh, is not a biological fact and only became science in the sense of anthropologists said that this is true in the 1940s. That's Nell Irvin Painter, historian, Princeton professor emerita, and author of The History of White People. I'm John Bewin, it's Seen on Radio. Welcome to part two of our series, Seeing White, looking at the past and present of whiteness in the world and especially the United States where this idea of being white came from and what it's for. In this episode, we're going back 
well, not really to the beginning. Science now tells us that in the beginning of the human story, people evolved in Africa from one common ancestor a couple hundred thousand years ago. We're all kin and all African if you just go back far enough. Over time, some people walked out of Africa and spread across the world. The branches of the family that spent thousands of years in colder places without a lot of sun, they lost much of their melanin and turned a bunch of different shades depending on the conditions where they were. That's how we became a species ranging from the darkest brown to the lightest pink beige and everything in between. Shades of brown with an array of yellowish and reddish tinges. All of that explains why people look different. It does not explain the wildly inconsistent and ever-changing groupings that people have concocted over the last few centuries. It doesn't explain my high school textbook. Okay, so I, I hope you've heard this, <clears throat> and, I, and I imagine you have, that race is not real biologically. The Genome Project uh, should have settled that once and for all 20 years ago. All of us are 99.9% .9 the same genetically. And even that 0.1% of difference is mostly about other things. What we think of as race, you could say, amounts to a paint job, just a few genes that determine our skin color, eye color, the straightness or curliness of our hair, the stuff that we associate with so-called race. It truly is skin deep, although it's even less real than that because we know skin color isn't a reliable marker of what we call race. <clears throat> now, in case anyone is thinking, wait a second, what about something like sickle cell disease? Doesn't that prove there are deeper biological differences <clears throat> that correspond to these ideas of racial groups? And the answer is no. Sickle cell developed as a mutation in places where malaria was present, not in all of Africa and not only in Africa. It has nothing to do with race. It is not a black people disease. Here's something I learned in making Seeing White from the scholar Dorothy Roberts uh, at Penn. The average person of Somali heritage has more in common genetically with a person of European background than the Somali shares with a person from Zimbabwe, for example. Again, that's all within that narrow 0.1% of difference in the genome, and it pretty much blows up our usual notions of both black and white races. In the course of doing the genome project, some of the first people to have their DNA mapped, their individual DNA, were the scientists themselves, including James Watson and Craig Venter, both of European descent, and Seong Jin Kim, Korean bio biologist. Guess what? It turns out Kim, the Korean, has more genetic alleles in common with either Watson or Venter than they share with each other. <clears throat> Again, there's just no gene for whiteness, blackness, Asianness fill in the blanks of the other racial uh, categories that people have described over the centuries. You might also have heard or read that the concept of race is a fairly recent invention. It didn't really take hold until <clears throat> four or five, 600 years ago, depending on where you kind of want, want to mark the beginning of it. And really important aspects of whiteness and blackness as we have come to think of them were invented here in North America after European and African people started showing up here. We just heard Nell Irvin Painter say <clears throat> that what was in my textbook in the late 70s about three races, that was the 1940s that that really finally became the standard story that anthropologist, anthropology was telling. Maybe you're like me. I'd heard these things in broad strokes, but had never learned really how it went down. Who did it? Who created race? Excuse me, I'm gonna pause and try to clear my throat for a second. How do I, uh, I don't know how to, did I mute myself? <clears throat> Who did it? <laughs> Who created race and when and why? We set out to tell that story in Seeing White with the help of a lot of brilliant people, including my collaborator and kind of co-host on the series, Dr. Chenjerai Kumanyika, who's now at Rutgers. 
I read the latest and best research and interviewed a few amazing scholars who've done that work. So let's go back to what is usually thought of as the cradle of Western civilization, Greece, more than 2000 years ago, Herodotus, the historian, the philosopher Aristotle. They thought Greeks were better than the other people they knew about, but <clears throat> it was on the, their, their idea was that it was, this was on the basis of culture. They thought Greeks lived in the right kind of climate to produce the most advanced culture. Places that were too warm or too cold produced inferior cultures. So their superiority in their view was not innate. They weren't racist in our terms because as the historian Nell Painter says, there was no notion of race. <laughs> people could look at other people and see some people were lighter and some people were darker, but what did that mean? What did that mean? It did not mean what it means to us. And it didn't mean, ah, those people are inferior, so that's what makes it okay for, for us to enslave them. Of course, there was a whole lot of slaving going on in the ancient world. People enslaved people across and within what we would now call racial lines. Oftentimes it was along caste lines or you know, as the spoils of war. The Greeks, the Romans, the Chinese, the West African empires all practiced forms of slavery. The Vikings, along with the other things that they pillaged, they pillaged people. They were big slavers, which is not, I don't know, about y'all, I didn't hear much about that growing up in the land of the cuddly purple people eaters. Um, and people of every color got enslaved, including and especially the Slavs of Eastern Europe. They were hauled off into bondage so often for centuries by so many different people, including the Romans and Western Europeans and people from North Africa, that the English word slave is derived from Slav. Did everybody know that but me? I, I didn't know that until relatively recently. Slavery wasn't justified on the basis of race because race as we know it didn't exist. So who invented it? The answer matters a whole lot, I think. Slave traders. Portuguese slave traders, it seems, were the kind of first to arrive at, at these ideas in the 1400s. In fact, a leading historian, I interviewed Ibram X. Kendi, now at Boston University, and the best-selling author of several books. You've probably seen him. You might have read his books. He points the finger at one man, a Portuguese guy named Gomez de Zorara. That's him highlighted on this uh, monument in Lisbon in the middle. In the 1450s, Zarara wrote a book in which he did something that no one had done before, according to Dr. Kendi. He lumped together all the people of Africa, vast continent, diverse people, hundreds of what we would call ethnicities in Africa. And he effectively created the notion of an African or black race. And he called Africans inferior beasts who would benefit by being brought to so-called civilization and Christianity in chains. Never mind that in that pre-colonial time, there were societies in North and West Africa that were as advanced as any in the world and rich for that matter. Zarara was writing about Prince Henry the Navigator, the Portuguese explorer and slave trader. That's him in the top spot on the monument. Here's Ibram Kendi talking about Zarara and what he did. And, and so I basically uh, make the case that he was the first articulator of racist ideas. And in order for him to articulate racist ideas, he had to basically combine all of the different ethnic groups that Prince Henry was enslaving into one people and then describing that people as, as inferior. And so presumably then he, though he did not necessarily speak as much about whiteness, he certainly created blackness. And uh, blackness, of course, cannot really operate without whiteness. And to Kendi, this is crucial. 
Zarara was not just some independent chronicler calling them as he saw them. As I said before, he was hired to write the book by the Portuguese king, Prince Henry's nephew. Zarara was also a member of the Military Order of Christ, which was like this para sort of military slash Christian organization, similar to like the Knights of Templar, and who was the leader of the Military Order of Christ? Prince Henry. And when Prince Henry said something, you were a member, you did it, uh, including made, make him look good for, for slave trading. So it's, it's fair to say literally that slave traders commissioned the invention of this sort of codified racist idea of black people and implicitly then, on the other hand, of white people. Yes. So a decade before <clears throat> Zarara wrote that book, Prince Henry had been the one, who, the first to sail directly to sub-Saharan Africa to kidnap and enslave African people. So really, he was really the innovator of what would become a centuries-long Atlantic slave trade. And it just happened to become very handy at about that time to have a story about the inferiority of African people, since they were now going to be the source of free labor. So nature did not make people into distinct races. People constructed race, and they did it for a reason to justify stealing the lives and the labor of other human beings for profit. There's one takeaway from this history that has always struck me as especially kind of mind altering. And that's, that's this, racist ideas about the inferiority of black people and other people considered not white came after the move to subjugate and exploit those people, not before. In other words, racist ideas are not the cause of racist policies and practices, they're the result. I think a lot of us assume that racism started with a kind of tragic misunderstanding. Some people, people encountered each other and some people failed to see the full humanity of other people. But historians like Kendi and Painter say, no, that's not what happened. That's a, that's a comforting story relatively. People exploited other people because they could, because they wanted the money. The story of race is the story of labor, as one expert put it in our series. And then the people who decided to call themselves white used this made up story of race to explain and justify that exploitation to other people, to the church, and I suppose ultimately to themselves. Racism didn't start with a misunderstanding, it started with a lie. And see, it's easier to make a case that someone is inferior if you're already oppressing them and keeping them in an undignified condition. Ah, let's see. Here's someone who got that insight hundreds of years ago. Dr. Kendi writes about a man named John Woolman he was a New Jersey Quaker white guy who launched a traveling ministry and abolitionist campaign in the 1750s. Woolman wrote, no one is inferior in God's eyes. And he wrote this. I think this is so striking. Place on men the ignominious title slave, dressing them in uncomely garments, keeping them to servile labor, tends gradually to fix a notion in the mind that they are a sort of people below us in nature. John Woolman saw that racist ideas were the result of slavery, not the cause. He went on to say, where false ideas are twisted into our minds, it is with difficulty we get disentangled. More than 250 years after he wrote those words, those false ideas are still twisted into our minds, most of us in varying degrees as white Americans. And what form does it take today? Those black people or Native Americans or Latinos, they're not quite thriving on average the way white people are. Their communities are poorer, their test scores are lower, they're charged with more crimes per capita. Something wrong with those people. 
those facts wouldn't have anything to do with 400 plus years of systemic racism and oppression. In another episode in the series, we trace how our notions of black and white were further refined in colonial America. Why is it that if your ancestry is mostly European, but you're, you've got some African heritage, that you're considered black and not white in the United States? That was not how the world worked, say in Virginia in the early 1600s. Definitions were looser then. Someone was English or African or American Indian or a mulatto of some sort, mixed heritage. The one drop rule that we're familiar with had not been cooked up yet. So where did that come from? And again, the answer is slavery. And again, we need to follow the money. English common law in the 1600s, which of course prevailed in Virginia, said that the child of an English man, a European man could not be enslaved. Slave owners didn't like that law. They wanted to be able to enslave their own children the children produced through the rape of the African women they held in bondage. So the colonial powers that be in Virginia changed the law in the 1660s, tying the fate of a child to her mother instead of her father. So now the children of enslaved black women would remain in bondage, whatever the race of the father. What follows from that precedent is hundreds of years of this notion often written into law into the 20th century in Southern states that having a little bit of African heritage puts you on the black side of the color line. You might be of mixed race or whatever, but we, you know, in, in US culture, to be white means to be, right, all white. So this, this practice, this construction, this invention, expanded the pool of people on plantations or slave labor camps, as they should be called, who would be enslaved, which increased the labor force and the profits of enslavers. We live with stuff like this every day, and we might sort of think, oh, I wonder how that kind of way of thinking evolved somehow organically in, in our culture. No, it's about money, power, and control. 1776, a new nation is born. Notice how these guys look kind of quite a bit like the last guys. Um, and that changes everything, right? Because unlike all those other countries based on an ethnic tribe, USA is, is different. It was founded on universal ideals. Well, <clears throat> true, the Declaration of Independence said all men are created equal. And later, people like Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King would appeal to those words to try to shame white America into behaving as if it believed those words. But when he wrote them, Thomas Jefferson was not talking about African people. Because he also wrote that, quote, the blacks are inferior to the whites in the endowments of both body and mind. And he still owned 130 human beings of African descent when he died. 50 years after the declaration. This, the historical record, and we got into this further actually in, um, in our most recent series on CNN on radio, which is about democracy in the US. The historical record is clear that Jefferson and most of the other founding fathers saw the United States as a nation of and for Anglo-Saxons like themselves. <clears throat> Of course, most people know the Constitution counted enslaved Black people as three-fifths of a person. I think fewer of us know this, that in 1790, after the Constitution was ratified and the first Congress went to work, the first law they passed was the Census Act, which counted white people, other free people, and slaves. The second law was the Naturalization Act, which said you had to be a free white person to become a naturalized citizen of this country. The United States is a settler colonial society and it was a white supremacist nation at its founding. I don't think there's any argument to be had about that. 
The Civil War ended slavery in its most literal form, but didn't come close to ending racism. The fight to make this a country where everybody of every race would have equal rights and full citizenship really didn't get serious until the civil rights movement of the 20th century. And then only after a courageous movement by black people in which some of those people had to give their lives because the white backlash was so vicious. And now here we are in the 21st century, the gains of the civil rights movement are under systematic attack. Attacks on voting rights are back with a vengeance and only gaining strength, pretty much fully supported by one of our two major political parties. So it's just, it's inescapable, I think, that white supremacy is not a blemish, uh, not a bug in our otherwise glorious national story, which I think is how we are taught to think of it and how I dare say I thought of it for a long, long time. It's a defining feature. Trust me, it, it gives me no pleasure to say that. Seeing White is a 14 part series, roughly eight hours long altogether, too much to cover in a 45 minute talk. But one other theme I wanna to touch on before we converse um, is the commonly held view among people like me, I think, and maybe many of us here, white folks from the Northern US that racism is a distinctly Southern thing. I'll speak for myself. I grew up with this idea. <clears throat> White Southerners are the ones with the huge ancestral sins to answer for, and they are the real bigots today. I devoted two episodes of Seeing White to countering this notion. One tells the story of the US Dakota War and the largest mass execution in US history in Mankato, my hometown in 1862. It puts those events in the context of the US government's violent and deceitful extraction of Native American land to create more space for people who look like me. And in part six, we take a direct look at the presumed innocence of white non-Southerners and progressive white folks in particular. Uh, here's a clip from that episode. Here I'm speaking with Shannon Sullivan. She's a philosophy professor at UNC Charlotte. I tell her uh, about a saying that I've heard from some white Southern friends about white people's views of black people in the North and the South. Northerners, meaning Northern whites, Northern whites love the race, but hate the people. Southern whites hate the race, but love the people. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, I think it, in, a, in a funny way that captures some of the differences. The, the other way one of them goes kind of an African-American folk saying, right? Um, in the North, they don't care how high you get, okay, they being the white people. So in the North, they don't care how high you get as long as you don't get too close. And in the South, they don't care how close you get as long as you don't get too high. <laughs> so different yeah. ways of managing social distances, physical distances. So it happens in different ways. There's been, a, you know, there's a long history of this different forms of etiquette, um, you know, manners, stat habits, and styles. Those styles are different, but they have a way of supporting still a society that privileges and, and advantages white people. Look at those measures of systemic racism residential segregation, racialized inequities in education and criminal punishment, police violence. They're pretty much the same, North and South. <clears throat> in fact, the most segregated cities in America, a lot of them are in the North, Detroit, Chicago, Cleveland, Milwaukee, New York. White dominance, white supremacy is the water we swim in as Americans and our culture trains us not to see it. We white folks are the generic people. We're just people. Race is something other people have. But white is a racial group. Uh, you know, it's a so socially constructed one, but one with real meaning and power in society. If you're counted as a white American, that means your ancestors were allowed to become citizens of this white people's country. It might mean your ancestors got land under the Homestead Act something most non-white people were excluded from. There's a good chance it meant your grandparents got a 30-year government-backed mortgage onto the Federal Housing Administration created under the New Deal. 
which allowed them to leave some money to their children, creating wealth that very possibly remains in your family. Most black people especially were denied that opportunity because of redlining, a practice enforced by the federal government. A lot of our white fathers and grandfathers went to college on the GI Bill and became professionals. Black men coming home from World War II in Korea, the GI Bill didn't exclude them on paper, but it absolutely did in practice. And they got the same kinds of jobs after the war that the segregated military had allowed them to have like janitor and dishwasher. All of this history, which of course, much of it, massive amounts of this impact were more recent than slavery. And it helps explain that profound wealth gap, right? And by the way, in my opinion, the need for reparations. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop sharing. Did I stop sharing my screen? Yes. Two takeaways from what I've said so far, and then I wanna hear what you all are thinking. One, race is not a thing biologically. It's a story that some people decided to tell. And two, people told that story to justify the brutal exploitation of other human beings for profit. Once those facts sink in, what that, what those, that those understandings about what race and racism actually are, where they came from. Um, and when you see that dynamic actually continue, uh, at work, you know, ever since the 15th century, I think one thing that becomes clear is that racism is not mainly a problem of attitudes, individual bigotry. Now, it's a tool to divide us and to prop up systems, economic, political, and social systems that advantage some people and disadvantage others. And it's a handy tool to convince, convince white folks who may or may not be getting a great deal out of our extremely stratified society to support the status quo. Because, you know, it could be worse, at least I'm white. Whiteness is still doing the job it was invented to do. Powerful people go to work every day leveraging and reinforcing this old weapon to maintain money and power in the hands of white people and really of a few white people in particular. I think that's been easier to see over the past five years or so than it had been for most of our lifetimes. Finally, the biggest lesson of all for me, and I think for all of us as so-called white people, if we understand that people who look like us invented the very idea of race, the idea of whiteness to advantage themselves and us, then we can see that racism is our problem to solve. It's a white people problem. And I'm not saying feel shame, feel guilty. White guilt doesn't get anything done and none of us here today created this racist world. What I do feel, and I, and I argue we should feel, is a stronger sense of responsibility to do something. These new understandings coming relatively late in life for me, I gotta say, have altered how I approach my work as a documentary storyteller and as a teacher. But beyond that, what does it look like for each of us? In the big picture, does it mean We'll support leaders who want to push ahead with a conversation about reparations and other measures to close the wealth gap and pay our enormous financial and moral debts. Not that we could ever pay them, but to do something <laughs> about them. Do we find the people in our communities working to transform unjust institutions and support that work at my job? Do I show up grudgingly for the diversity and equity meetings, annoyed that I have to be there? Or do I try to figure out how to really be an accomplice to my colleagues of color? Wherever we decide to show up, I think it's important that we show up with humility and vulnerability and a willingness to learn and to give up this power and advantage that we didn't earn. I genuinely believe that we all stand to benefit if we could create a society that's not built on the exploitation or oppression of anyone. I think that would be a happier place to live for all of us. But in the end, we should show up and figure out how to take action because
because it's the right thing to do. Thank you. Uh, and I would be happy to continue the conversation. Thank you, John. Uh, you can use your Zoom reaction to applause. I have learned this trick recently. Um, and it, it feels a little strange to applause after such a heavy topic, um, but I personally am so appreciative of the work that you've done, John. We've used it a ton here at LSP to engage in really difficult conversations, and it's just been incredibly useful. So um, thank you so much for your contributions. Um, thanks, thanks also to Lisa for giving it a great introduction and um, Megan, my coworker, for providing tech support. Y'all are great. <laughs> um, for the Q&A session of our time this evening, um, we're going to use DAC um, to track questions, people who have questions. So if you're not familiar with how that works, um, if you have a question for John, just type the word DAC into the chat. I know there's at least one person who's joining over the phone. Um, I, if you have a question, um, you can just go ahead and unmute. Um, but let's see, we've got a question already here in the chat from Chris. Um, Chris, do you wanna unmute and go ahead and read your question aloud? Sure, thank you. Uh, Mr. Bewin, could you please share how white supremacy has impacted the agricultural industry. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And it's a good one and an important one. Um, <clears throat> it's huge. Um, yeah, and I wish I, I wish I, that could be its own 45 minute talk, right? Not that I'm capable of giving it right now. But I would, I would point you actually to, I was gonna see if I could quick find it and put it in the chat, but um, I did an episode um, for the public radio show Reveal and then that, that is also in the scene on radio feed called Losing Ground, which is about a black farmer in North Carolina who, um, a couple who um, lost their farm, had their farm foreclosed on and taken away from them about five years ago after uh, 20 years of pretty systematic discrimination by the USDA. Uh, you may have been paying attention to, some of you know about Pigford, no doubt, um, and the Biden administration is actually taking some relatively strong steps and making some pretty relatively strong statements. I think Tom Vilsack, to some extent, is trying to redeem himself um, uh, for some, you know, being part of some times that were not so great in the Obama administration, the Obama years. Um, and trying to be somewhat more proactive in dealing with this terrible legacy of, of racism and discrimination against black farmers. Again, it's something that, you know, so much damage is done that, that can't be fixed in any kind of easy way. But um, yeah, I mean, the fact that one thing that's, I think, really important to say is that if we had had any kind of a enlightened isn't even the right, I mean, that's way too strong a word, but if there had been even a modicum of justice at the, at the end of the Civil War, we would have done that thing that General Sherman wanted to do, <clears throat> which was to give, uh, and actually, um, let's see, was it, was it Stevens or, uh, or who was the other radical Republican um, who wanted to go further and basically to take all the land that had been owned by plantation owners uh, in the South and give it to black farmers. Um, so that would have been, <laughs> that would have been fair, but to basically just free folks from slavery and say, good luck, you know, you're free to walk down the road now without a penny to your name. And you may actually be arrested for vagrancy and put in jail and then loaned out again, essentially into slavery on, the on a plantation, possibly the same one you came from. 
and then to have systematic white supremacy um, reigning ever since, you know, it's, it's striking actually that 14, this figure you see now that 14% of farmers in the country were black at one time, a hundred years ago. And now it's what, 1%, less than 1%, I think. So it's profound. Should I just be looking at these in the chat or is, or is uh, Elizabeth or do you want to? We are tracking. Um, so we have a question from Rachel Henderson. Go ahead, Rachel. Hi, uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm really excited to be here because I've loved your podcasts and I've loved working with Lens Stewardship Project um, and racial justice in, in farming and food and farming. Um, and one thing that has so inspired me, Elizabeth mentioned at the beginning that LSP's approach has been um, based on this idea that came from uh, talking to allies in people of color organizations uh, and trying to sort of like organize ourselves, white people get out in, in rural communities and organize ourselves. And I was really inspired by the way LSP really decided to make our space an anti-racist space. And it's made me want to think, it's made me think about how I like living in rural Wisconsin in all white spaces can go into other places and make them anti-racist. And it's been really, really hard <laughs> to do that. And uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts for people who live in communities like the one you grew up in where we don't have a lot of opportunity to um, lift up people of color. Um, if you have thoughts about what we can do as we work with our neighbors and try, try to, make more of rural white America anti-racist? Mm -hmm. Boy, you know, I think it, it so much depends. It's such a kind of case by case or what's going on in different communities. But I, but I guess as a, if I were gonna try to answer that in any kind of general way, it seems to me a couple things. One is to, to, to look at to what extent are there organizations led by, um, Black or Indigenous or other people of color that are that are working on issues that you can support in some way, and how whatever that might mean, right? Whether that means writing a check, whether it means becoming a member of their organization if you're welcome to do that, whether it means, you know, fake, finding some way to to put your shoulder to the wheel with, alongside folks. Um, and and as you, I think your question is suggesting there may just not be any people of color or so few that, right, that there aren't organized groups to speak of in a lot of places, especially rural places, then I think, I guess, and I really commend um, Land Stewardship Project, and I think that's, and I work for an organization, I work at Duke University, but more, more um, directly and specifically, I work for the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke, which is, you know, it's 35 or 40 people, it's a, kind of a smallish to medium-sized nonprofit slash educational organization. And we have made a similar pledge really just in the last few years, an overt statement that we are about trying to be an anti-racist organization and figuring out exactly what that means. Um, and it, and it, it has been a place that was predominantly white for a long time in a place that is not predominantly white, right? So, I mean, Durham, North Carolina is, it's about 40% white, 40% black, um, significant Latino population and a range of people from all over the place. Um, so I think that kind of statement and, it, and, and even in a smaller rural community, if you can even just begin to find a small group of people who would want to begin to meet and organize and just to start conversations. What it, what, it, what it would mean to start an organization, even if it's three people, you know, because then maybe it'll be five or six or eight or 10 someday who are trying to do anti-racist work in your community and figure out what that mean, would mean. And I think it means something different. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, that's why I, I, I find it hard to, Oftentimes, to, to the extent that people, um, and I, you didn't do this, and that's not, I'm not responding to your question this way, but sort of like 
the what we should we do question. And I guess it, people, first of all, need to figure out what suits them and their aptitudes and their interests and their, uh, what they're capable of, but also to figure out what, what would it mean in your community? What are the needs and where can we push? Where can we organize and apply some leverage somewhere? I also want to share a comment from um, Jace, Jason uh, or Julie Montgomery, Jason and Julie Montgomery, uh, suggestion to start a surge showing up for racial justice chapter with other committed whites in your neighborhood. Um, that's a suggestion for Rachel, Rachel specifically. Um, and, and let LSP know how we can support because we're also trying to figure out how to do this thing of doing racial justice organizing in mostly white rural communities. Um, so yeah. Oh, I am. I am <laughs> <they can't>, you know. <laughs> Oh, I know you are, Rachel. <laughs> Rachel's a board member of LSP. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, let's let me take another look. I see um, Shona has her hand raised. Shona, you have a question. Yeah, it, so actually to go along with um, Rachel's question in, in that like, what is our role as white people to engage people who don't, aren't having these conversations, who aren't even thinking in these, along these lines? Um, I mean, it seems like to me, we're all, this crowd in particular, it seems like we're well-educated. Um, we've gone to college. Uh, we've had this sort of like social, social awareness built into us through education. But like, what is our role in terms of engaging people like, as an organization, a, a primarily white rural organization with you know, lower income, less educated uh, white rural people? And have you seen any successful models around that? Uh, again, that's a, yeah, that's a really good question I, that um... The education gap is is big, and uh, I mean, some of the I, I've become something of a, an obsessive about politics. Actually, you know, I think the Trump years just about pushed me over the edge. But um, you know, and sort of trying to just understand the dynamics, and you, you know, you may have seen just the the breakdown by in terms of the way white Americans vote voted in the 2020 election and in, in a lot of the elections just between the two parties recently, depending on whether they went to college or not. It's dramatic. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, there's also a gender gap, which is pretty significant. People who look like me um, are, you know, we're, we're, we're a problem. Um, but yeah, so I, you know, it's, it's tough. I, I think, I think one of the things is, I guess, and this is something that I try to do is to approach people, um, approach people talking about really nuts and bolts kinds of issues and about facts and history, but also, and about economics and trying to steer clear of some of the, um, Kind of buzzwords and and uh, you know the kinds of things that can be easily dismissed about oh I, I I see you know you're one of those you're one of those people but to just talk in kind of and it's and when I say I, I'm reluctant to say this because it sounds like I'm suggesting like dumbing down that's not what I mean when I say using plain English I just mean using um, using language that's that's about the real stuff, as opposed to the kind of language that's going to sort of mark you as the party you vote for, or the you know the being one of the quote unquote woke ones. And oh my God, I'm so tired of that word. Um, right. So I guess that's and, and and finding people who you have some kind of contact with, whether it's people you go to church with, your neighbors, right? People you have some kind of relationship with to start to begin to have conversations. Um, my friend, Celeste Headley, who was um, 
co-hosted with me the, the, the following season that we did after Seeing White, which was about patriarchy and sexism a series called Men. She's kind of an expert on conversations and she's done TED Talks about that and so on, written books about it. And she talks about the just trying to um, ask a lot of questions and, and try to get, get folks talking about what it is they care about and why they feel the way they do about things. And that that can work wonders in opening up conversations where you might begin to be able to find some common ground or to say, you know, I've been thinking about and then to be able to eventually say, you know, I've really been thinking about this whole racism thing and, and I hadn't for much of my life, but I've really found myself learning some stuff and, you know, I wonder if you'd be interested in hearing about, you know, so stuff like that, right? And just trying to find ways to have those conversations. Those of you who've listened to Seeing White know that, um, you know, Chenjirai, for example, my, my friend and collaborator on that series, he, he you know, it, it became a little bit of a running joke, the idea of dialogue as the solution to things, that he's very skeptical of that, that it's, if you take this, this point that I was making about, you know, Ibram Kendi's lesson about the cause and effect, that it's, that's poli we need to change policies and then the the attitudes might come along, but so that so that I think you know policy and, and actually finding ways to wield power is is actually really important. But I don't think that has to mean that you know people who think a certain way. Well, let's just get together and let's just steamroll those people who don't think that way. Right? I think we need. We need, in order, to, in order to organize and to wield power, you need to bring some people along too, right? So it is it ultimately, it's, it's too simple to say, well, it's not about hearts and minds, it's about power because you've got to win some hearts and minds in order to wield power. So I do think those conversations are important and in, and in a smaller rural place, uh, I remember this from, Lord, 30 plus years ago when I was a young reporter covering rural Minnesota for a few years. Um, it, in a place of a few thousand people, or, or never mind a place with 500 or 700 people, a half dozen people in that town could work wonders um, in terms of leadership and in terms of making things happen. So it's rambly, but that's, yeah. And, so that's yeah. what I got. Interrupt, if I could note that it's really important to remember that uh, persistently white places are the places that are especially ripe for white supremacists. And so by the same token, they're also incredibly important places, perhaps, you know, arguably for white people, the most important places in which to organize. And yeah, as you say, it can, it can be sick people that, you know, like, I feel like I benefit enormously from doing that kind of work with others. And, and Thank you for sharing that, Lisa. And I also, I mean, this is something we talk about at LSP and our organizing is the fence sitter theory. So um, on one side of the fence are the white supremacists who wear robes and whatnot. And on the other side, there are people like us. And then in the middle, they're the people who are on the fence. They could go one direction or the other. Our role is to pull those people on the fence over to the anti-racist side. Great question. Yeah, and, I, and I guess I'd complicate that to say, I don't even know where the fences are. And it's very clear to me that many times I'm on the wrong side of that fence and I need a, a white ally to help me to understand. Yeah, and I, I thank you, Lisa and, and Elizabeth. And I, the thing that I would add is um, one thing that, that, that I have come to believe is that most of, most of the white people who would think of themselves as the good white people, progressive white people, aren't doing anything, <laughs> you know? So, and, and, and this, is, this is how I felt for many years. It was sort of like, well, going about my life as a good non-racist, right? I, I don't think I'm doing racist stuff. I'm not doing harm in that sense, as far as I'm aware. So I'm okay, I can kind of go about my life and I can, as I said, I can kind of root for, as Lisa was referring, I can kind of cheer on 
the people of color as they try to overcome those people over there who are the racists and I'm in this neutral ground. But, but if, we can if, if we can take, and I do think, and, and I, that's the thing that I may, may be most proud of about having done something like Seeing White, and I didn't see this coming, I didn't see the life that it was gonna have coming, that, um, that it's, I feel like, you know, that there may be a whole lot of people who were sort of in that category who kind of went, oh, <laughs> like, shit, I need to figure out if there's something I can actually do where I can get involved and take some action. That that is also, that's another, right? That's another gradation in that thing you were laying out, Elizabeth, about people being on the fence. Lots of nuance for sure. Um, I think we have time. I'm gonna try to squeeze in one more question. Um, Tessa, Tessa Laswell has a question. Let's hear from you, Tessa. Thanks so much, John. Um, I listened to your podcast and I've been a fan for years, but I just wanted to uh, pick your brain a little bit about the intersection between inequitable food systems and racism in the food systems and then climate change. Um, and if you could talk about that. <laughs> in our okay, short four question. minutes left. <laughs> yeah, so what exactly is the question? Um, uh, yes. Just your thoughts. Yes, I'm going to say yes to that. Uh, the intersections of food inequities and, and then about climate change. By the way, I'm gonna, don't tell anybody. <laughs> I'm kind of joking here because this is a modestly public thing, but um, the next season of Seen on Radio is going to, let's just say the next season of Seen on Radio is gonna go there. Um, what can I say for, for, the, for the time being in a couple of minutes? You know, so all of these things, maybe I'll just say this, capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I mean, um, when we start talking about, uh, you can't separate the, um, the birth of white supremacist, white supremacy <laughs> and of uh, a racist slave trade and all of these forms of exploitation and um, extraction and so on from, from a system of capitalism that we are still so living with today, right? Um, yeah, Elizabeth says capitalism is usually the answer. And that obviously is very intertwined with all of our systems, including, you know, people comment frequently on the absolute insanity of our healthcare system, for example, that that's run on capitalist, on the capitalist base, you know, on who can make profit. And then of course our food system is based on that as well. My, my wife is a Polish immigrant and um, she came here 30 some years ago and she just kind of couldn't believe the way Americans eat. And um, especially then, right? And uh, <clears throat> how could it be that, you know, people were, eating white bread and Twinkies. Um, well, <laughs> capitalism is the answer. Right? So, so that, that that's so intertwined with all of these things and certainly climate change. My friend and fellow podcaster, Amy Westervelt said something the other day. She said, you know, trying to imagine getting out of solving climate change under capitalism, at least anything like the form of it that we have now is, um, you know, probably not gonna happen. So a poor attempt at answering your question, but how about that for now? I appreciate the question and I appreciate your listening. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> we're coming up at eight o'clock and I think this kid is about ready for bed, <laughs> um, which means that we're gonna have to wrap things up here. Um, this is Theodore, by the way, he wanted hey, to make Theodore. a little uh, cameo, pull up my earring. Um, I thank you all for participating and for such rich questions. Um, I really want to encourage all of y'all to stay connected with LSP. We're going to keep having these conversations. Um, I, every time I find myself in this kind of space, I feel like we leave with more questions than answers. So um, in that spirit, I want everyone to 
share in the chat a question that they are leaving oh. the space with this evening. We'll go ahead and take a few moments for that. And then before you log off, I also have an evaluation link that I'm going to drop in the chat. Um, oh, wow. It'll take like three minutes to finish. So let's see your question <laughs> that we will leave unanswered. Thank you all. Appreciate the kind words and everybody coming out. Appreciate the work you all are doing, trying to do and trying to figure out how to do. It's not easy, but yeah, <laughs> we need to do stuff. Yeah, it's such really such great questions. Um, I'm ready for another hour, but um, all right, here's the, oh, oh shoot, I lost my evaluation link um, because I copy and pasted something else. Uh, hold on a second. There it is. Um, I'm also going to email this link out in a follow-up email along with the um, recording of the talk tonight and all of the wonderful resources you all have shared. Um, so keep an eye out for that and we'll probably come out sometime tomorrow. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks. So Thank much. you everybody. Take care. Be safe.